to get right to it. Deacon Adams this morning is going to open us in prayer. Sister Cynthia Green is going to come and bring an introduction of our lesson. And that will be followed by Reverend Peace, who is going to do our exposition this morning. So we're going to get right to it. But before we do, I do want to welcome um, all of our family who are over in YouTube land and on Facebook, those who are calling in by phone. We just are so glad you chose to um, study with us this morning. Deacon Adams, would you go ahead and um, lift a prayer for us? Heavenly Father, we who will bring this lesson this morning ask that we may decrease, that Jesus might increase. Let your word go forth in power and be a blessing and life-giving to those who hear it. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. There was a young pastor who was visiting an elderly member in the hospital, and she was quite ill near the ending of her life. And the young pastor asked, would you like prayer before I leave? Yes, she whispered. The pastor asked, what would you like me to pray for today? Pray that I will be healed, she replied. The pastor thought to himself, this poor woman, she can't accept the inevitable. She isn't facing reality. However, he bowed his head and he prayed. Lord, we pray for your presence to be with our ailing sister. And if it be your will, we pray she will be restored to health and service. But if it's not your will, we hope she will adjust to your circumstances or adjust to her circumstances, amen. Well, the woman opened her eyes and she threw her legs over the side of the bed, stood and exclaimed, I'm healed. She proceeded down the corridor shouting, look at me, look at me, I'm healed. Well, the pastor, he just closed his mouth and he slowly walked out to his car. And as he opened his car door, he looked towards heaven and he said, Lord, please don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> How often do we say we believe God can heal but struggle to believe it? In the lesson that Reverend Peace will present this morning, we will be strengthened by the faith of four friends and the power of Jesus to heal brokenness, mind, body, and spirit. Reverend Peace. Thank you, uh, Sister Green, for that um, wonderful uh, opening. It, it captures our attention on this lesson. Let me share the lesson with us all. Today's lesson is titled, Call to Heal. The scripture is Mark chapter two, verse one through 12. Uh, the adult and young adult topic is uh, healing for the whole person. The uh, youth topic, going out of your way for a friend. And uh, the children's topic, stand up and walk. Uh, the adult, young adult and youth, key verse, verse nine, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. The children's key verse, verse 11, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. The author of Mark's gospel, John Mark, lived in Jerusalem with his mother, Mary, who was a leader in the Jerusalem church. Mark accompanied his cousin Barnabas and Paul on their famine ministry and on their first missionary journey. But John Mark left them at Perga and returned home. This later caused a division between Barnabas and Paul and led to Barnabas taking Mark under his wing. However, before Paul was martyred, he acknowledged Mark's ministry and spoke highly of him. Elsewhere, the apostle Peter called Mark my son, which indicates that it was probably Peter who brought Mark to faith in Jesus Christ. It was this close association with Peter that lent apostolic authority to Mark's gospel. Since Peter evidently was Mark's primary source of information. Mark recorded a vivid picture of the events in today's lesson 
which are likely based on Peter's recollection. Wearsby makes a compelling argument that this episode probably occurred at Peter's house since the whole city knew where it was. Refer back to uh, Mark 1, 29 through 32. Miracles are predominant in Mark's gospel. There are 18, and they are used to demonstrate not only the power of Christ, but also his compassion. So let's begin looking at Jesus brings hope to a house, verse 1 and 2. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door and he preached the word to them. Jesus had become extremely popular among the people. The people wanted to be near him and to watch him perform miracles. At a prior time in Capernaum, Jesus preached in the synagogue and astounded the people with the authority exhibited in his teaching. He also cast out a demon in the synagogue. Afterward, Jesus entered Simon Peter, Peter's house where he healed Simon's mother. When word got around by that evening, the whole city was gathered at the door of Simon's house. Jesus healed many of the people and again cast out demons. Then the word came to him that everyone is looking for you. Jesus told his disciples, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose, I have come forth. Now on Jesus' return to Capernaum, a similar situation was happening again. Although many of the people were enthralled with his miracles, Jesus' preaching of the word was preeminent. When Jesus announced his formal ministry, quoting Isaiah 61, he first declared, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. Preaching was necessary so that the people could understand that they must respond to the call of God to repent. They must turn away from their sin and turn to God who is eagerly awaiting to receive them through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus preached the word, the Logos. The word, the Logos of God is Jesus Christ himself. The apostle John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word of God is also God's speech. The Hebrew writer declared long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. It is worth noting that Jesus' preaching did not deter the throngs of people who came to be healed. They received hope as Jesus carried out his ministry to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to free the oppressed and preach the year of the Lord's favor. Now, let's look at unroofing the roof. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. In that day, doors to common homes were never shut unless the inhabitants had some acute need for privacy. Otherwise, the door was open to anyone who wished to come in and out. Barclay notes that uh, in humbler homes, such as this must have been, there was no entrance hall. The door was open directly to the street. The roof of a Palestinian house was flat. The roof consisted of flat beams laid across from wall to wall, perhaps three feet apart. The space in between was filled with brushwood packed tight with clay. The top was marled over. It was easy to dig out and 
the filling between two of the beams and it did not damage the house very much and it was easy to repair the breach again. So the four men dug out the filling between two of the beams and let their friend down at Jesus' feet. Faith in Jesus' power to heal and forgive, verse five. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. The fact that the four friends of the paralytic man wanted so badly to get him into the presence of Jesus indicates they believed Jesus had the power to heal. The men acted in faith. Jesus saw their faith. A plain reading of the text indicates that the pronoun there refers to the faith of the four men. The uses of they repeatedly refers to the actions of the four men. They came to him, they uncovered the roof when they had broken it up and they let down the bed. The passage refers to the paralytic man separately from his four friends. So question, why did Jesus say only to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you? First, many biblical scholars believe Jesus was addressing the thoughts in the paralytic, paralytic's mind, which aligned with Jewish tradition, that his debility was due to his sin. Pardon me. Pardon me. Therefore, Jesus forgiving his sins freed him from that mindset and allowed him to receive Jesus' healing. Second, Jesus was popular among the people for his preaching and miraculous healing. But his popularity also drew criticism from the religious leaders who apparently sent envoys from the Hat Sanhedrin Council to spy out Jesus' ministry. Jesus used this opportunity to create a dilemma in which the religious leaders would entrap themselves and expose the error of their belief. Question, did Jesus really forgive the paralytic man's sins? Absolutely. Jesus' forgiveness freed the man of his sin before God. Then how did this man benefit from Jesus' forgiveness? Well, it engendered faith in Jesus. It freed him of guilt driven by religious tradition and cultural prejudice against him. It opened his heart to receive healing from Jesus. Questioning the Lord's power to make us whole, verses six through 12. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes, mostly Pharisees interpreted the law and were experts in cases where people were accused of breaking the law of Moses. Clearly the scribes did not believe in Jesus' divine authority to forgive sins. Ironically, they were correct that only God can forgive sin. But what they could not reason in their limited understanding is that Jesus is the son of God who is equal with God and the head of all rule and authority. But immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say arise, take up your bed and walk. Jesus sees the opportunity to challenge their reasoning about his divine authority. Jesus asked a question and created a, a dilemma they could not reason away. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? If they answered your sins are forgiven, then they could not disprove the veracity of Jesus' declaration of forgiveness. 
If they answered, arise, take up your bed and walk, then they would be confronted with immediate proof of Jesus' authority. They hesitated to choose either option. But that you may say that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed and went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Jesus had no doubt about his authority or his calling. He acted with authority and compassion Jesus commanded the man to rise, take up his bed, and go home. Miraculously, this paralyzed man did exactly what Jesus commanded. Healed from paralysis, the man went among the people, and they were amazed, saying, we never saw anything like this. They glorified God. They knew this was a miracle only God could perform. In this one act, Jesus obliterated the opposition and invalidated the doubt of his critics. Barclay summarized the moment in this way. You say that I have no right to forgive sins. You hold as a matter of belief that if this man is ill, he is a sinner and he cannot be cured till he is forgiven. Very well, then watch this. So Jesus spoke the word and the man was cured. On their own stated beliefs, the man could not be cured unless he is forgiven. He was cured, therefore he was forgiven. Therefore, Jesus' claim to forgive sin must be true. Jesus demonstrated his authority to forgive sin and yet again, his authority to heal. Jesus fulfilled a foundational truth of scripture lifted in the minds of the scribes that only God can forgive sin. The whole essence of Jesus' life is that in him, we see clearly displayed the attitude of God toward mankind. It is an attitude of perfect love, of a heart yearning with love and eager to forgive. That is perfectly stated in John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus was called to heal not only physical bodies, relieve burdened minds, and comfort the oppressed, but most importantly, he came as the perfect sacrifice for man's sin. Jesus Christ has the power to forgive us of our sin and to make us whole. Amen. Amen. What a powerful lesson that we are about to discuss. And I want to right now pause and just encourage you, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, or right here in Zoom, there is someone um, watching the chat. Um, and panel, I don't know if you had a chance to see um, Dr. Wood had some questions. And because um, the, 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 the students and the other platforms um, can't see those questions. I'm just going to um, read her comment as we go into our discussion because I think it's excellent. Um, Dr. Wood says she wonders if we've been so informed illustratively regarding the Ruth in this story. She thanks Reverend Peace for that exposition. Um, and she points out that no house was damaged beyond repair. They did not vandalize the home. And she wonders if we have such friends in our own lives but more, she wonders if we are such friends to others. And she asked the question, what will we do to lead others to the message of Jesus? So I know that this is a, just a dynamic discussion. So I'm going to get out of the way and I'm going to ask Sister Denise, if you would start us off and just um, begin to talk to us about the impact of this lesson on our lives today. Yes, good morning again. So the first thing that was really uh, beautiful, I like what Dr. Wood said about friendship, 
it just reminded me that we need to be prepared to go through whatever we got to get through to get to Jesus. They were so adamant and firm in getting to Jesus. They did what was necessary, picked that roof apart uh, for their friend. And we need to have that same kind of attitude. Sometimes we let things keep us from church or from serving. And we really need to eliminate any obstacle that is going to prevent us from being closer to God. And then secondly, I noticed um, that Jesus gives us what we need. We sometimes pray for what we want. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God didn't give me the things that I pray for sometimes, give me what I need. The man wanted to walk. He wanted to be healed, but God knew that the most important thing was for his sins to be forgiven. And so that's that. And then also, lastly, uh, the Lord cares about all four parts of us, our physical, mental, emotional, our spiritual. Um, we can't separate that. We need to be able to give everything to God because he knows what to do with that to make us be what he wants us to be. So those are the three things that I saw in this lesson. And the main thing I wrote down, um, we talk about, you know, I've already learned from my grandma, the mustard seed faith, but I said, it's really mustard in mountains. If I were to write a book about it, because if you got the mustard seed faith, then you can move the mountains. And that, like Dr. Wood said, that's what his friends demonstrated, mustards and mountains. <laughs> Amen. Amen, Sister Denise. And I thought about those friends as well, you know, the friends of the paralyzed man and, um, and their determination to get their friend to Jesus. Um, can you just imagine, you know, you're carrying him up these stairs, no small feet of, of his own. And even though the roof didn't do any damage, you still had to work at it to open it up. It showed the great that this man had um, a richness. We know that his, his circumstances, but he was rich in the love that his friends had for him. And that, um, in that in their faithfulness that Jesus honored their faithfulness and healed their friend and their friend his the thing is I got out of that is Jesus there's nothing too small for Jesus there's nothing too great so often we give Jesus the great things in our life you know well you know I need healings from this this sickness you know and I bring that to Jesus I have financial concerns and I bring that to Jesus but Jesus is concerned about even the small things in your life a child who's going to take a test on the next day can pray to Jesus that he hears them and will give them the knowledge, give them the intelligence, give them the remembrance to help them with that test. God is concerned, and like Sister Denise said, about every part of your being, being your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul, the physical things in your life. He is concerned about those things. So like those four friends, we want to think about that that their demonstration of care and concern for the believers, as believers and as Christians, we should have that same care. We have the potential as Christians to express the love of Jesus in our efforts to help others. Jesus will empower us to successfully complete the task. So people let your light shine in the world by the work, by helping others in need, amen? Amen. I feel like I'm in a relay race. Sharonda got us off to a good start, passed the baton to Cynthia. Cynthia kept us in the lead. Now I got it. So let's, let's hope that we keep this thing going. I, I want to focus on the paralytic. Paralysis. I mean, what does that mean? The man could not move. He could not do anything for himself. His mat was a prison to him. He cannot feed himself, he cannot clothe himself, he cannot clean himself, he cannot do anything by himself. This is what we have to keep in mind. And, and, and many people in the crowd might say, well, you need to just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, I don't have time for you, I got to deal with my own problems, but thank God for at least a few people who will pick you up on your mat because you can't help yourself and get you where you need to be, that's to Jesus. And I, I, I think all of us, you know, many people don't experience physical paralysis, but I think every person at some point in their life or at multiple points experienced some form of paralysis. We were talking before this lesson about anxiety. That's, there, there could be psyche, psychological paralysis that many of us go through and a lot of us 
where we can't help ourselves and spiritual paralysis, regardless of what form it comes, there's times when we are helpless and we can't help ourselves, but thank God for those who will pick up our mat and even put us up on a roof and lower us down through a roof to, to Christ. Thank God for those people. And I'm thinking of some folks right now in my own life. Um, but then the man had to allow himself to be lowered. Now that's dangerous. And he had to entrust himself and he had to humble himself to let folks lower him. Cause if they dropped him, he gonna fall like a wet load of laundry and he can't catch himself but he allowed himself to be lowered into Jesus's presence. And as Reverend P said, the first thing that Jesus said was, son, your sins are forgiven. Son, I accept you. I'm, and we don't see where the man confessed every sin he committed or, or anything. He didn't, we don't see where he said anything or could have said anything. Jesus is about removing barriers. He's more concerned about removing whatever obstacle is between us and him inside of us than about rubbing our nose and what's wrong with us. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. The crowds get out of our way, but friends can help us through it. But Jesus can help us with the stuff that's inside that he gets over. And the man got up after Jesus told him to because only Jesus can fix it. And his mat was no longer a prison. He was carrying it. That's only Jesus can put us on our feet. All right, I'm passing the baton off to the anchor. Go ahead, Reverend. <laughs> I went and grabbed some resin so I wouldn't drop the baton. <laughs> Powerful, um, Deacon. And you know, the things that you talked about, um, I think is uh, are buoyed by the fact of what this lesson says. And that is that we must always remember that Jesus clearly displayed the attitude of God towards us. It is an attitude of love. It's an attitude of God yearning to forgive us. That's God's attitude towards us is demonstrated in Christ himself. No matter what we are going through, Jesus loves us. God loves us. And he is willing, look at this. He's willing to interrupt what we think his agenda is in order to address our needs and to bring us comfort. He's never too busy. <laughs> He's never too busy to address our needs. That's God's attitude towards us. Another thing that this lesson brings out in, in, my, in, my, in my view, if I can scroll down to my notes, uh, we are invited, we are invited to, um, to seek Jesus at our times of greatest need. Let me say that again. We are invited to seek Jesus in our times of our greatest need. Now, now we all have different gradations of need. And at different times in our life, we have different gradations of need. Uh, notice that in last week's lesson, we saw Jesus preaching on the shoreline. He's reaching out. He's, he's, um, he's inviting people into the kingdom. Today, we see him in a common home, preaching the good news, receiving everyone that came, as the scripture says. And it reminds us of a wonderful scripture that we are left with uh, from the Hebrew writer, from the Message Bible, Hebrews uh, 4, verses 14 through 16. I'm going to read this because that, I think uh, the way um, it is phrased, I think, is very helpful. It says, now that we know that we have Jesus, the great high priest, with, uh, with uh, ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is ready to give. Take the mercy and accept the help. Remember, we are invited to seek Jesus at our greatest times of need. Amen. Amen. I, I don't know that you guys are paying attention to me, but I'm over here having a great, great time in the word because so much of what you guys 
are talking about really ties into our lives today. And it's not just a story that we hear and, and don't have application for. We all have been, as Deacon Adam said, paralyzed in some kind of way. So how do we move this from our head to our heart so that we can walk away this week encouraged in the word? Sister Green? Amen. Um, we've heard that um, we know about the paralytic situation. We've heard about anxiety. That's an example of some things. And in our community, we hear a lot now in the news about the COVID circumstances, not only those who um, um, attract the disease, but the lasting impacts on their bodies afterwards. Keep that in mind, because today I want you to keep that as, your, as a family challenge. This is a family activity to make a list of the conditions that you, are, that you know are challenging people in our communities. Um, maybe some of you may know of people in our church. And as a family, commit to pray that God, that he will intervene to bring peace to each and every one of those circumstances and situations, amen? Amen, Sister Cynthia. Um, what I would tell the young people is to, if you can think of times when you really could not even, felt like you couldn't do anything, couldn't help yourself, think of those people who picked your mat up. Remember them now and talk about it with, with your family members and have everybody go around and think of some times when that happened and then together pray that God makes each of you and each of all of us mat carriers. And also remember that when Jesus got us on our feet, when we thought there was absolutely no hope and praise him for that. That's what we need to do this week and every day. Amen, Deacon, um, that's good, good counsel. Uh, to the young adults, I, I want to um, kind of make this uh, personal in the sense of uh, looking at this from the paralytics perspective uh, has been brought out many places in this lesson. Um, I know that at this point in your life, um, you still have a lot of the, you know, the optimism and um, you look upon life as not having, you know, a lot of weaknesses, but a lot of strengths. But at the same time, I know that you are also experiencing challenges either in your scholastic activities or in your work situations, not to mention in your family situations as well, trying to meet all the decisions that you have in front of you and all the responsibilities that are upon you. And so I'm asking you to do something simple this week. I'm asking you to confess your areas of physical and spiritual brokenness to God in prayer. Very simply, confess your areas of physical and brokenness, uh, spiritual uh, and physical brokenness to God in prayer. And then I want to uh, commend uh, two scriptures to you this week. Uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, which we uh, read earlier, and Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And I, would, I just want to really, I just want to read Philippians uh, 4, uh, 6 and 7. Uh, to you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lift those scriptures in your mind, recite them and memorize them, and talk with God in prayer about what wonderful things he has promised in regard to your physical and spiritual brokenness, which he is able to heal. Amen. Amen, Reverend Peace. That goes right along with the adult ministry challenge this week. So family, we talked about um, how we may hold back from God the things that we think we got to hold. You know, I got this. I got this. That's our good phrase. But this week I'm challenging you and it's called the four parts, the four parts challenge. When you're praying this week, I want you to give God access to every part of you physically, mentally, spiritually, 
and emotionally give that to God even the things that you think you got a hold on you might well I got a hold of my finances well I got a hold of this give it to God anyway because as Reverend uh, Peace said there are some things that we think we got but we really don't have we really don't have it let Jesus have it because he can do better with it so this week you got the four parts challenge during our prayer meditation we're going to be open and cognizant of giving God access to every part of our life, even the part that we think that we got under control, saints. Amen. Amen. This lesson has just been um, so phenomenal and so timely as the word of God often is. Um, I want to ask you, Sister Denise, um, if Dr. Douglas, actually, the question I have for you is Dr. Douglas also um, lifted it. So I'll use his phrasing. Um, all infirmities are not due to personal shortcoming. Like, you know, all Jesus pointed out when he healed the man who was born blind, everything that ails us is not um, because of a personal shortcoming. But there are times that we need a healing um, that is deeper. And, and one of the things that uh, Deacon Adams brought out was that, that Jesus called him son. And that is such a glorious thing to be, son is not gender specific, to be called a son of God is something that we crave and that we run into, that I am a son. So someone is not a son of God. If someone male or female is not a son of God, how can they get healing in their relationship with God um, even beyond their um, physical healing. Sister Denise. Amen, I'm glad you asked. So family, you know, we were talking. So notice uh, the man needed to walk, the paralytic, he needed to walk, but what did Jesus do? He forgave him of his sins first. And that is what we need. We need forgiveness of our sins so that we can be closer to Christ. How do we do this? We do this by confessing. The word tells us if we confess with our mouths, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. It's that simple. If you've been listening to this lesson and you know that, the obstacle that's preventing you from being closer to God is sin. You need to let God remove that obstacle. He provided us with a savior that is perfect so that he would take on our sins. And so you don't have to worry about getting yourself right, getting yourself together, because guess what? You can't get yourself together, saints, uh, family. You can't get yourself together. So allow God to heal you the spiritual part of you and work on all parts of you. So if you've been listening and you know this is you, pray with me right now. Father God, I confess, Lord, uh, that I am a sinner, Lord, and I am in need of your salvation, Father God. I believe that you are the son of God and that uh, you died for my sins, Lord God, and that God raised you from the dead. You were raised from the dead for my sins, Lord God. And Lord, I give every access, every part of my life, Lord, to you. I give you access to everything, Lord. I give myself over to you, Lord, knowing that I'm safe in your hands, Lord God. And I thank you uh, for this prayer, Lord God. Continuing in prayer, family. Father God, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to learn of your word, to share, Lord, to come together with one another even virtually, Lord God. We thank you for what you're doing uh, through us, uh, through this ministry, Lord. Bless each and every family represented at TAB in the neighborhood, Lord God. Let us take this and be like the friends, Lord God, to help someone get closer to Jesus this week, Lord. And we thank you and we lift your matchless name on high in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed um, with Sister Denise, if you want to be made a son of God through relationship with Jesus, the Christ, our Lord and Savior, um, we are so excited um, for you because we know that that secures your eternal salvation and gives you perfect healing um, where it matters. So we would love to walk alongside you call our church office at 
3325 and someone is standing ready to pray with you. Um, if you have to leave a message, please do. We will call you back and get connected with you. Don't be deterred. Call us today. Um, beyond that, if you're seeking membership with a local church, whether you be near or far, go ahead and visit our website at www.tmbcdetroit.org. That's tmbcdetroit.org. On our website, you can scroll just a little bit and you'll see a link that says come home to family because that's what we want to be. We are your family. We are the people who will lift your mat, who will pray for you, encourage you, and walk alongside you in your Christian journey. You'll be able to provide us with just a little bit of information to get to know you. And again, one of our ministry team leaders will be contacting you just as soon as we receive that information. Now, there are some who are visiting with us for the first time. You are our guest and welcome to Tabernacle. We hope that you know that um, you are so very special in the eyes of God and we just want to get to know you. So you can actually text the word welcome, W-E-L-C-O-M-E, -E, to 313 898 three, three, two, five, and it will begin a wonderful relationship. Um, we'll ask you a couple questions just to get to know you and we'll be reaching out to you. So now family, it's the word time even deeper. So I don't know if you have, you need to be on Wednesday nights. Let me just, just a, a shameless plug for the word of God. On Wednesday nights, our pastor is teaching the word of God um, in such a way that we can all pick something from it. We can all glean something that just will bless you through the week. You don't have to be out there alone. You can be connected to the word of God. You can find all that information on our website. But he was teaching on so tough on Wednesday that I know today at 11 a.m. the word is going to be rich in the sermon this morning. So call your friends, text your family, get over to our Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church Detroit YouTube or Facebook page because the Tabernacle family is going to enter into collective worship. We may be separated in our homes, but we're joined together in worship at 11 a.m. and you are invited. So I look forward to seeing you over in worship. God bless you. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great day.